Joe here. Today we'll be taking a look at this game, Von Manstein's Triumph, published recently by Knack War Games. Game designed by Francisco Ronco with graphics from Ivan Caceres. This is a two-player card-driven operational game about the third Axis attempt to capture the port fortress of Sevastopol in the summer of 1942. And today we'll be going through the extended example of play found in the playbook of this game. And this game starts with each player drawing their initial hand. The Germans always draw eight, and the Soviets will have six cards. Here we see the initial German hand. Now the German player decides to discard five cards. And the Germans draw five new cards. And this is now the Germans' new hand. Now, in this game, there is a special bombardment phase at the beginning of turn one, where the German player can bombard spaces on the map, but only with three types of cards. Air attack, heavy artillery, or super heavy artillery cards. So we begin with the preliminary bombardment phase where the Axis player can play any airstrike, heavy artillery or super heavy artillery cards from his hand. And he starts by playing a super heavy artillery card against the area that contains a fortress and three blocks that comprise a Soviet division. And because it is an area with an intact fortress, the Axis player has to roll a six to destroy the fortress and also to cause hits on the blocks there. The Axis player rolls three dice and only obtains one six. And with that six, the player destroys the fortress. And we mark the destruction with a fortress destroyed marker. Next, the Axis player chooses to use his air attack card in the same area. But now the Soviet player reacts and plays the fighter cover reaction card in his hand. And this card can nullify the German airstrike. However, the Axis player has a fighter escort card in his hand and he plays it to cancel the just played Soviet card. And so the German airstrike is resolved. The fighter escort card, not only cancels the Soviet card, but removes it permanently from the game. The Axis player now rolls three dice. He needs five or sixes to cause any hits because the fortress has been destroyed, but he's out of luck. And now the three cards that were played by the Germans in the preliminary bombardment are discarded, and the German player now mixes the discarded cards with the rest of the cards, shuffles them, and draws three cards to fill up their hand up to eight. Notice that the Soviet player does not draw any cards and he has five in his hand. Now to facilitate the explanation of this video, I will lay all the blocks flat on their back in the same way as they appear in the extended example of play. Now we go to the axis action phase and he begins by playing a card. The Axis player plays an airstrike on the area occupied by the 54th and Perekop Soviet regiments. The Axis player rolls three D6s and gets no hits. Once again, the area has an undamaged Soviet trench and that makes the area harder to hit. The German needs only sixes to hit. Afterwards, the Axis player plays a redeployment card to activate the 121st and 122nd German regiments and moves them in a southeast direction. Next, the Axis player plays an assault card to activate the 50th German division and places the division's activation marker on the card. The card played has a double use, but in this case, the player uses it as an assault card and declares a coordinated assault. And that is done by playing a second assault card, this time to activate the 24th German division, 
placing that division's activation marker on the card. Now the player can move the two divisions, that is six blocks in total. In addition, each card gives the player a chance to place an engineer and an armor marker on the board. And the Axis player decides to bring an engineer and armor marker, but with just one of the cards, placing the markers in the zone where the two 50th German Division regiments are located. Next, the player initiates an immediate combat by moving the six division blocks to the area where the Soviet 54th and Perekop regiments are located. Now we resolve combat, but first the players mark the area where the combat will take place, and they move their blocks to the respective positions on the combat display. The defender's blocks are always placed in the central position, and the attacking blocks in the surrounding areas, grouping and placing them according to the area from which they entered combat. Next, the attacking German player chooses the support cards he will play for combat and places them face down. Now, the defending Soviet player may choose support cards and place them in the same way. The players now reveal their cards and play them. The Axis player played a field artillery card which adds three dice to his combat die roll. The cards played by the Soviet player allows him to place a minefield, an anti-tank, and a bunker marker. And two additional dice are rolled on account of the mortar card. The German engineer counter allows him to remove the mine marker. And the Soviet anti-tank marker allows the Soviet player to attack the German armor. The Soviet player needs a 5 or a 6 to cause a hit. But he rolls a two and the German tanks suffer no casualties. Now we count the number of dice that each side will roll in the combat. The Axis player will roll one d6 for each block and it has six. An additional one d6 because the Axis has more steps, 21 to 7, than the Soviets. Three additional dice are added because of the field artillery card and then 1d6 is subtracted because the combat is taking place in an area with rough terrain. And the resulting axis total is 9 dice. The Soviet player rolls 1d6 for each of his two blocks and an additional 2 dice because of the mortar card for a total of 4d6s. The axis dice roll produces 3 sixes, that is, three hits and the armor marker allows the axis player to improve one of his dice by one and making a five a six and this adds an additional hit to the total and notice that for the axis player he needs sixes to cause hits because the area contains an intact soviet trench now the soviets roll and they manage to hit twice with a 5 and a 6. And because the combat is happening in an area with an undamaged Soviet trench, the Soviet player can improve one of his dice by one, making a 4, a 5, and so resulting in 3 hits. The Axis player, however, can cancel one Soviet hit because there is an Axis armor marker in the combat and the Axis player chooses a 6, which also helps to avoid one of the Axis units becoming exhausted. The Soviet player can also cancel one Axis hit because there is a Soviet bunker marker, and it doesn't matter which hit because the defending player's blocks never become exhausted in combat. After counting the hits, now the players apply them. One of the German blocks with a strength of 4 points must suffer a casualty by subtracting a strength point. The other hit can be applied to any other block. The Soviet Perekop regiment must suffer the first casualty and then the Soviet player must assign the rest as he sees fit. And in this case, he decides to assign one hit to each unit. The Axis player must also roll 
for the Axis Pioneer marker since it removed the minefield in the second combat step. The player rolls and obtains a 3, so the Pioneers do not suffer any casualties they would have had if the result was a 5 or a 6 as indicated in the counter. The Soviet side suffered more casualties and loses the battle and must retreat from the area, removing from the board the anti-tank and bunker counters. Having lost, the Soviets now have to retreat and they will split the retreating units into different zones. Next, the Axis player must move at least three Axis blocks back to their original area to avoid overstacking in the captured area. In this game, stacking limits are a maximum of three blocks per space. Now, these blocks do not suffer any casualties due to retreat from an enemy area because they're not actually retreating. Once this is done, the Axis player places a Trench Destroyed marker in the area and the area will never again provide the benefits of a trench to Soviet units. After the marker is placed, the Soviet player plays a Counter Attack card, which must be played immediately after a combat in the Axis action phase is finished. This card allows the Soviet player to temporarily stop the opponent's turn, which will resume after the Soviet activation and any resulting combat. The Soviet player uses the card to activate the three blocks of the 172nd Rifle Division and they move to an adjacent area. Now we continue with the Axis action phase and the Axis player plays the Heavy Artillery card, using it against the area where the 381st Soviet Regiment is present. The Axis player rolls four dice, as the card indicates, but rolls no sixes, and sixes is what the Axis player needs to damage the Soviet Regiment because of the intact trench. Next, the Axis player plays an Assault card to activate the 170th German Division and places that division's activation marker on the card and moves its two blocks into the area occupied by the Soviet 381st Regiment. And this starts a combat which must be resolved immediately. In this combat, neither side plays any cards and the Axis player decides not to place any Pioneer nor Armor marker. The Germans fail to score any hits with two dice and the Soviets roll one die and they also fail. And in this game, in case of a tie, the attacker wins the combat, except if the combat is in an area with an operational trench owned by the defender, which is the case here. And in that case, the defender wins the tie. The Axis player must withdraw their two blocks to the area they started from. And that area is adjacent to a Soviet block other than the one involved in the combat. So the Axis player now has to deduct one strength point from one of his blocks for retreating into an enemy field of fire. The Axis player still has a card in his hand, but does not wish to use it. So the player decides to end his action phase, and now both players refill their hands by drawing cards from their respective decks. The Germans up to eight cards, and the Soviets up to six. Now we go to the Soviet action phase. Here we see the Soviet player's hand. Soviet player first plays an assault card and places an armor counter and a pioneer's counter with the blocks of the 172nd Rifle Division and then moves them to the front lines. The player moves two blocks and the armor and pioneer counters to reinforce the decimated Petikop Regiment and the 747th Rifle Regiment to the south of them, as a maximum of three blocks can fit in one area. By moving the blocks, the Soviet player gives an opportunity to react to the German player who can play his airstrike card as a reaction. And he does so and places an interdiction marker in the area that the two blocks move into. 
This marker causes the Soviet player to roll a die for each block that enters the area. A result of five or six on the die roll causes a casualty. This time, luck smiles on the German Air Force and each block suffers the loss of a strength point. The Perekop Regiment, however, has not moved and is not affected by the interdiction marker. The marker remains on the board and will affect any Soviet block that enters the zone in the future, either through movement or retreat. Next, the Soviet player plays another assault card and places two more markers, one armor and one pioneers, this time with the 54th Rifle Regiment. The Soviet player decides to activate the 172nd Rifle Division again and moves the 747th and 514th Regiments to the area where the 54th is and the 514th Regiment is not affected by the German interdiction marker as it only affects blocks that enter the area where it is located, not blocks that leave it. And once the breach is closed, the Soviet player ends his turn. Both players draw cards from their respective decks to complete their hands, and the turn marker is moved to the next space to start the June 10 to 12th turn. A word about units becoming exhausted. In combat, each hit by the defender caused by a modified die roll of six must be applied to a different attacking unit and that unit becomes exhausted and the block is placed face down to show its status. While a block is exhausted, it can defend normally, but it is unable to attack. Now, exhausted blocks can only be rallied by declaring a pass action. And a side that declares a pass action cannot play any cards during his turn. But the player can discard as many cards from his hand as he wants. And every exhausted block recovers and is returned to the stand-up fresh position. Also, the player can withdraw from the map board any pioneer or armor assets for later use, and these are set aside to re-enter the game on their two-step side. Of course, declaring a pass action will yield momentum to your opponent, and this is one of the tough decisions to make in the game. And this is the end of this extended example of play of Von Manstein's Triumph, a game designed by Francisco Ronco with graphics from Ivan Cáceres and published by Knack Wargames. And I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.